Okay, so I'm talking to Kevin Rose with Convoy of Hope. Uh, Kevin, what's your official title here at Convoy? Yeah, I'm Senior Director of Partner Relations for International Program. Okay, how long you worked here? 11 years. Okay, um, what is it you do in your role? So in my role, Convoy works with a lot of different partners. Partner can mean a lot of different things. So in the international side, um, we work both with what we call field partners, and then we, which would be people that we actually do activity with, programming with on the ground. Then we work with groups called solution provider partners, which would be groups that are water experts, you know, kind of a niche focus that complements what we do. Mm -hmm. We have food partners that help provide product for us. And then we have funding partners. So those are a lot of different elements of that. And then I also do some other things in the org with being a liaison between like our communications department and our fundraising department, development department, helping them understand the strategy of international program, helping be a buffer for our operations team, and just making sure that there's a link internally in the organization to make sure everybody understands clearly what our what we're doing. Okay. Uh, so as we relate to international, mm -hmm. Where have you worked and where do you work? Sure, so Convoy's active uh, right now in 14 countries. Um, and we work in, uh, I can, do you want me to list all 14? Or we work Asia, we work East Africa, West Africa. We have some operations in the Middle East and like Lebanon. And then in this hemisphere, we're in Haiti and then Central America and a few countries. Do you uh, do site visits to those places or do you have uh, international directors? We do there? both. We have international staff. So we kind of have three ways that we operate on the field. That would be brick and mortar operations, which would be a convoy registered NGO on the ground. It's just a little convoy in the community. Um, and then we've got strategic partnerships that would be with like-minded organizations that we, um, you know, we're not just resourcing them, but we're together coming up with strategy. We do targets together. And then we have resourcing partners, and these would be also like-minded ministries, but we may resource them with food and products. So we do, we have reporting mechanisms on all those different types with different levels, um, but we have in our brick and mortar operations, Convoy of Hope staff, and then we have regional connections and representation here in this office, and they travel and do site visits as well. Mm -hmm. So let's just jump right into this. What would be a strength of an international NGO okay. versus one on the ground, a local one? What are some things that you might be able to do, accomplish sure. or get done that they can't? I think that when you look at a national NGO versus like an international, it would be access to resources, access to connections. Um, you know, the from an international perspective, we're going to have a network that goes outside of the borders of the country. Um, you know, that, that helps obviously even the resource side, but also helps on the strategy because our pool of best practice and evaluation and working with colleagues is much bigger than just the national side. Um, so I think resource, connection to um, different subject matter expertise, kind of just a bigger network is, is one of the benefits. Mm -hmm. What in your years of working in other countries, and some I'm imagining are un, what we would consider undeveloped mm -hmm. or developing sure. countries, what are some of the things that have surprised you, like things that you wouldn't have ever guessed or you didn't anticipate? Sure. I think that, you know, I probably would have answered that differently in my first year versus my 11th year. Uh, I think that one of the things I'm always surprised by is just the, um, the people have amazing abilities and resources themselves. And so I think early on in my career, it was much more on the we, we offer and we hold all the solutions. And I've learned very early on and learned more and more all the time that it's really about partnering with the people that we serve, even more than partnering. We're kind of the silent partner in the wings that's encouraging them. And, um, you know, hopefully you guys know a phrase, asset-based community development. So we really want to come alongside communities. And you ask questions first, not what do you need, but like what do you have? Because when you figure out where the baseline where people are at, then you see how you can partner with them or help invest in what they already have to make a change in their community. And that's where you see the results uh, last a lot longer when people have buy-in and they are part of it. So I'm just always amazed at the just the lives that people live. They're, they're just incredibly, I'm always amazed at the, the happiness that's there. And I've definitely learned that there's a very much a poverty, there's poverty everywhere. There's poverty in the U.S. because poverty isn't just a monetary issue alone. And that's big, one of the biggest things I've learned is that we have to be careful that we don't just look at their poverty from an economic standpoint alone and realize that everybody is, has some kind of poverty in their life. And so that's, that's probably a lot more than you asked for, but... No, that's good. Yeah. Actually, uh, I make the class read Toxic Charity. Okay, good. 
and of course you know one of the things he says is never do for people what they have the capacity to do for themselves and we also talked in class about don't do for people do with that's right absolutely so talk a little more about that asset base sure so you know let's just take a school feeding program for example we focus on school feeding programs because one it's proven to kid bring kids to school more consistently two it helps with their nutritional ability to learn and retain information and three when kids get more education in their life they're gonna it's gonna benefit them a lot longer on that side so an element of community ownership and partnership is you know even just simply down to getting the moms to volunteer they're the ones that are doing the work and preparing the food or they may be able to have a small garden at their home where they can grow tomatoes or onions to complement the food so that's a very simple example um, but, th- but that's an, uh, an example of partnership. Or on the women's empowerment side, we always go in and we do a, uh, a market assessment in a community to see what businesses exist. And then we go through a journey with the women to see what exists, what gaps they see are there, and what ideas they have. And some of the best ideas from businesses are always going through that journey with them on gaps that they see. So again, working with them and seeing what's in their hand is, is crucial. Mm-hmm. How difficult or is it difficult to raise money in the U.S. for international causes? Because I know in some people's minds it's like, well, we need to take care of our own people yeah. first. Yeah. What, what have you encountered with that? Um, I think some of the biggest things that we see is we're seeing international disasters change, and that, that's challenging for us. Uh, if you have like a Haiti earthquake like we saw in 2010, obviously that's on everybody's radar um, you know, it's that shock fact that brings a lot of resources and awareness. But the reality is, is like what's happening in a place like Yemen right now or in Venezuela with our current news climate in the U.S., it, it doesn't necessarily get the, the, the media attention that drives the awareness that drives to the resources. So, but the, the scary thing is we're seeing more and more of those being the main types of international disasters. They're slow moving, your famines, your droughts, your, your political unrest that don't hit the major markets here in the U.S. to raise the attention. So it's really got us evaluating how do we structure our funding on international disasters to ensure that we're not waiting on a great media response, but we're kind of planning a programmatic response ahead of time. So that's a challenge of it. But in a sense of, you know, Americans are very generous. We're blessed as an organization and and we're growing always, Um, but it's probably our ability to meet the need, we're always way behind the curve, and especially we're seeing that more and more with the unique types of disasters we're seeing. Mm-hmm. So is it challenging to raise money for international causes? Uh, it is challenging, but not impossible. Mm-hmm. I think that you know we have to, um, you have to work harder at making the general public aware of some issues that, that aren't, on, like the Venezuela crisis is, is devastating, but the average person probably isn't super dialed in to what's going on. So being committed to a little bit more of advocacy and promoting and what's happening, that side of it, and promoting from a very pot, we try to make sure we're coming at it from never a political position, but coming at it from a humanity position. We're, we're bringing, we, we put the human need in front of things and not just the political side. Because you talk like a Venezuela, you know, people think the political side or look at what's going on in Central America, you know, which are a lot of our program activities. People think about the political piece. We try to always bring it back to it's about humans, it's about humanity and keep it focused on that. But um, it's, it's, we're doing it, you know, we're, we're do, but it's, you definitely have to be, you know, creative and, and work hard. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about culture a little bit. Sure. As it relates to culture, compare and contrast, say, working in the U.S. versus uh, international. Sure. I love talking about that, actually. I think that um, one of the big culture differences I see is, you know, let's say East Africa, you know, a developing country. Um, you know, you may have malnutrition, uh, lack of access to clean water. Um, you may have all of these devastating statistics, but what you almost always have is a sense of community, where I think where we see a lot of times the difference in U.S. poverty is we live um, very isolated lives where we don't necessarily know what's happening around our neighbors, and so people, um, it's not even just people living in poverty in the U.S., it's really kind of a little bit, we live this very isolated culture where community isn't a natural fabric, and so I always think that that's an interesting dynamic between they always have a leg up on us, honestly. You know, I mean, yes, they're they're facing a lot of really difficult things, 
But at the end of the day, they have this incredible sense of knowing their neighbors and sharing the burden of things. And that's just an interesting, uh, you know, kind of spectrum on, on the cultures. I don't know if that is at yeah, all what you're looking at. That's great. And and then how do we deal with the culture of, um, well, I think we call it in, in our class unintended superiority. Okay. But like, hey, you guys are just lucky we're here attitude, yeah. even yep. though we don't say it. Yeah. How, how do you deal with that? Say we do have people, for instance, with MBAs, PhDs, and advanced degrees who studied causes, sure. and you roll into an uneducated community. What's the dynamic of dealing with that and not coming across like you know superior? Sure, I think that I mean humility is always a, your best tool you're going to have in any backpack of your life. Um, you know we deal with that a lot because we get to engage. Um, short-term teams in our work and you know that that's honestly a big training tool that we go through is helping them realize that just because their situation looks very different than yours does not mean that you truly understand and you know ensuring that they're coming at it from a position of we're here to serve and to learn and so that's the biggest thing that I can always encourage no matter what situation if you're going to Africa or going to a new community in Oklahoma coming from a position of we always have something to learn every time you step into something new you're going to do okay in life and especially in the international stage. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with, if for lack of a better way of framing this, corrupt government systems sure. that you have to buy, go through sure. in, in every pretty much every country, right? Sure. Yeah, I think one of the biggest things I would say to that is you got to work with people that are closest to the need. Me, Kevin Rose from Springfield, Missouri, there's no way that I can ever understand the intricacies of a place like Haiti. So that's why working with people that are close to the need that you can trust, they can help navigate those situations, whether it's corrupt, difficult government situations or even fraud and programs where you're working. Um, you know, there's just a cultural dynamic because of where I come from, I can never truly get down to the root of it. And honestly, sometimes where I come from can make the work more difficult. So making sure that like your representation on the ground is done by people that know the culture, they're from the culture, they have the language, they know, they know all those elements is, is crucial to be able to navigate that stuff. It's, it's you know, there's, there's challenges, you're never going to fully avoid it, but I think my fail safe is to always work with people that know it best would be That's our recommendation. Good. But how do you get like shipments of food in or sure. things like ports? And you're going to have to go through some agency to get that yeah. done, right? Yeah, absolutely. So you, um, you know, for example, we work with clearing agents in most every country that we're working with. But again, these clearing agents have offices there locally. Um, there's just some of the stuff like, you know, for example, we're working in some places right now that, um, you know, to do the process correctly is costing us more money. There's probably a way that we could do it and you could probably pay somebody off and do it that way. But we risk we risk our operation, you know, really for the long term. So just making sure that you're working again with people that understand it, um, especially working with those clearing agents that live in the countries and know it and being committed to keep you safe and, and just counting the cost a little bit that it's probably going to cost you a little bit more to do it correctly and, and being committed to it taking a little bit longer as long as it's done right. Mm -hmm. So if I live here in Springfield and I'm thinking, boy, I really care about hungry kids around the world. I just don't know if I can get online and just look at a nonprofit right. and trust it. What's the good piece of advice or more advice that you could give somebody to, to figure that out? Sure. I would, um, you know, more important than just the financials, it's really looking at the strategy and understanding, you know, can you clearly tell what somebody's mission is and can you clearly tell that they're holding themselves accountable as well as measuring if they're being successful or not are really crucial. So with Convoy, you know, we talk a lot about feeding kids, but the reality is, is we are committed to feeding kids because we want to see thriving communities. So hopefully you're seeing that connection as you're looking at different groups with what their goal is and what their mission is to their activities. Do they support that? And are they tracking it in a way that's going to tell them if they're successful or not? Is that going to be on their website? Hopefully, if, if they've got it right, no. I mean, if they've got it right, hopefully. Um, it, it's, it's No, it's not on everybody's website. I think that, you know, if you, uh, anytime you get the chance to talk to somebody from the organization to really dig in on some of those questions, I encourage that. That's great. Um, but, no, I don't think that it is on everybody's website. Okay. 